Good evening to all. I'm very happy to welcome our guests at the Center of the History of Roman Philosophers and our experts for the coming week. We are very happy to welcome Sandrine Bergès here. She will uh, uh, teach on Olympe de Gouche and Mary Wollstonecraft at our autumn school and uh, Dr. Ackermann will let us know what is about the philosophy and the ideas of Christina of Sweden. Dr. Ackerman, welcome, welcome. You and I go back a long time. It was 30 years ago that you wrote a chapter on Christina of Sweden for my volume on the history of women philosophers. And 30 years later, now we're finally meeting in person, which is a delight. What made you fall in love with this amazing character, this amazing woman that uh, you now devoted most of your academic life uh, to researching yes. and translating? Yes, I've been spending 30 years working on her. And at first it was a difficult uh, situation seeing what she was like, because she had been portrayed as an intellectual woman, but not in a positive light. You know, she was often criticized for being narcissistic, domineering, power interested, and people were not focusing on her real intellectual capacities. But it has to be said that she's a woman of the Baroque period, and she was becoming queen of Sweden by force of nature. That is, her father, who died when she was six years old, had two other daughters who died uh, in, um, in, in, when they were babies, and she was the third child, but, but a woman. And she then was the only heir to the throne. And she was actually brought up to be a king. You know, a woman who is brought up as a king has a training like all other young men uh, and been trained in hunting, shooting, uh, also in judgment, making good judgments. So she and, was brought up to be a king, not a, a queen. King, yeah, this was the specific idea that they actually had. And in the coronation ceremony, she is crowned king of Sweden. It's said, king of Sverige. And uh, this is, of course, something that can be seen as being forced upon her. But she was uh, handling this in a very interesting way. She brought in culture. She brought in learned men from abroad, among them Descartes and to illuminate her uh, rather uh, uh, poor and uh, dark country, Sweden at the time, dominated by Lutheran orthodoxy. And in came a lot of intellectual people from France and Paris, mostly because it was the Fronde in Paris, which meant that people wanted to get away from Paris, not to get up into, into the revolution. So they chose to come to Sweden, not only Descartes, but lots of other people from Germany, from, uh, from the Dutch countries, and I Italy and France. And all of these ideas somehow opened her up for the idea that there is something greater out there. Sweden with its darkness in uh, the winters is not everything. They probably have also better food out there, <laughs> larger uh, orchestras and choirs and so on and so forth. So she quietly decided to leave. And this was, as I'm going to show tomorrow, something that developed uh, during about 10 years from 1646 when she writes her first letters to Descartes to, to finally entering Rome in 1656, 10 years later. So it's a long process with a lot of intrigue, and it has been a mystery why Descartes went there, and also why she abdicated. And all of these mysteries are being made plain after a while by me. <laughs> <laughs> and this is why I'm infatuated with her, because she has been a, like a big checkerboard or puzzle uh, to figure out how, you know, how, how really are the pieces going to fall. Uh, so, so uh, my first impression was that she, like also my, my um, uh, thesis advisor Dick Popkin said, she must have been much more interesting than she has been portrayed. She was probably much more of an intellectual because of all of these correspondences. You know, she yes. cannot have been just this kind of narcissistic person who, 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 who wants to 
how all light shine upon herself, which is the way she was portrayed, basically. So, uh, well, I want it's to been a ask long, you long a question. journey. Long journey. <laughs> I so, want to uh, ask you so, a question yeah, about a rumor that I heard. Yeah. And I, I don't know this at all, and I hope you'll set me straight. I was told that, of course, we all know the story that Descartes died in Stockholm, and every, the French blamed Christina for it, and demanded that his body be returned to France, and that she complied, returning his body but retaining the skull, is this true? <laughs> well, and that the skull then resided in the Königsmuseum. Well, it's true, but it's probably not at all her doing. Because, you see, he was a Catholic. He couldn't be buried within the churchyard. He was buried outside the wall, the church wall. Which meant that there was a captain, I think his name was Israel uh, Bassmann, who dug up the skull and placed it in his tavern, saying that this is the skull of Descartes. Now, there are two skulls of him. One which is this that rested in the tavern, and then another one. And I think the one in the um, Monsieur des Invalides actually is the one that was owned by this Vassman. And uh, so she had nothing to do with it. It was just that they had made the grave outside the wall so anybody could go there and dig. There were two skulls. Descartes did not have two heads. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> so. Um. The other one, I'm, I'm not sure about its history, but it's apparently two okay. skulls around. And, um, you, you know, skulls of famous men were like, like a cult object. Yes. Like the geniuses. How, how, yes. how, what, what, what would the skull look like? So. I'm looking forward to learning for myself, and I'm sure everyone else in attendance is also to learning more about Christina's uh, views, her influence in uh, philosophy and in, in helping to uh, mentor other philosophers, um, uh, how her philosophy affected her personal life, who the other uh, intellectuals of the period were that she was in contact with and what their interactions were. Um, of all of those, which aspect of her life intrigues you the most? Well, I think the lasting impression of her is that uh, in spite of abdicating, she actually preserved her sovereignty. She was called La, La Regina in Rome and was considered to be a royalty, although she had uh, formally uh, denied being so. And this means that she had to recreate herself. I call my book The Phoenix Fire after a medallion that she had with a phoenix bird burning on the, on the ashes and then recreating herself. I think this is a symbol of her abdication, that she could somehow go away from the throne, lose her country, but also recreating a new uh, situation as a patron of the arts and having an academy in Rome, which was very influential. So this somehow very interesting uh, attempt not to be put into the shadows, so to speak, after an abdication where you have no power anymore, but have to recreate your position. She managed that, which is very impressive. So I think that this is really, and one wonders how much of Descartes' uh, philosophy of the will actually <laughs> influenced her in forming that uh, personality, that intellect that made that possible. Okay, thank you very much. Dr. Hagen Gruber, you have, I think, some questions for Dr. Berges. Yes. Sandrine, you're an expert, and we are very happy to have you with us. You're an expert who has done such an enormous work on Sophie Grouchy, who was also an other outstanding philosopher of that time. And only recently, let's say, you turned to Olympe de Gouche. And knowing your work and all these things, I'm very interested to hear your interpretation also of uh, uh, and on Olympe de Gouche's uh, uh, philosophy. But please tell us first a bit about her life, you know, in strict terms. When did she live and uh, how did she end? Okay, well, I think everyone knows how she ended and that's uh, how most people during 
the French Revolution ended at the guillotine. Um, she she was born in uh, in the south of France in, in Montauban um, in 19, uh, sorry, 1748. That's right. Um, and she was brought up speaking not French as such, but Occitan. She was brought up running in the streets, talking with uh, the local kids. Um, she didn't have much of an education. She went to the local um, non-school and, and picked up some reading and writing, a bit of maths. What uh, a, a young lady from uh, the province would, would be expected to know, but not much more. But she, interestingly, she had the chance of getting a much better education had her mother wanted her to, because her father was not her mother's husband, but he was um, a local nobility, the Marquis of Pompignan. And he was himself a playwright, um, one of Voltaire's great enemies, because he was a bit pious, and Voltaire didn't like that much. Um, and he offered to take on his uh, illegitimate daughter and, and teach her. And we don't know why, but the mother said no. No, I, mm -hmm. I take care of her education. And she didn't do a great job of that. Mm -hmm. Now, when she was uh, 17, um, Olympe was, um, she wasn't even called Olympe then, she was called Marie. She was called Marie Gouze. Um, she had her stepfather's family name, Gouze, which she then changed to Gouze, because softening the Z, but that's, that's, that's a very small change. And she then took on also her mother's first name, Olympe. That was later in life. When she was 17, she was married off to um, a man who was working, he's sometimes called a butcher, but he wasn't. Her stepfather was a butcher. He was uh, somebody who was in charge of getting meat and charcuterie and, and other such food stuff for, um, for nobility. So he, that, that, that's what his job was. He wasn't actually a butcher. So it was a little bit better in terms of, of rank. Uh, she didn't like being married to him, and she didn't stay married to him for, for very long. He disappeared. We don't know whether he died or just left, or, or whether she just left him. But we, heard, we hear nothing more about him by the time she was 19. And then she had a, a little boy, and she and her little boy moved to Paris, and she changed her name. And then she used, um, she used the fact that her, her real father was from the nobility just dropping a few hints here and there to get into the right kind of society. She met her half-brother. Uh, she started making friends and... Um, and she became a playwright too? She became, well, she became an actress first. Mm -hmm. Before she became a playwright, she joined um, amateur theatrical groups and then she set up her own. And then eventually, but quite a lot long, about 10 years after she moved to Paris, when she was in her late 20s, she started to write but not before that. And w one reason, perhaps, is that she wasn't very comfortable in French. She wasn't brought up in French. She was brought up in Occitan, and she would have had a very strong accent when she first came to Paris as well. So she had to get used, she had to, get used to, to the language, um, and she had to get used to writing as well, but she never did, in fact. She never felt comfortable holding a pen. And, of course, you have to remember that back then, you know, they used you know, goose feathers, which is probably... I mean, I don't think I'd be able to write with one of these, and she certainly wasn't. She wasn't comfortable with it. So she had to wait until she had enough money to employ a secretary. Mm -hmm. Now, people made a lot of that. They said she was illiterate. Um, they, they keep saying that she was illiterate and that she didn't write her own stuff, but, but we know that women philosophers tend to get that treatment anyway. Mm -hmm. So she once challenged somebody who... Uh, she, was, she was just in a, in a car on the way from the suburb to Paris, and uh, she just, it was a carriage, there were a few people there, and there was a man next to her who was talking about the famous Olympe de Gouges, saying he knew her very well, he was one of her admirers, wink, quick, you know, not much, um, and that, uh, you know, everyone knew that she didn't write her own stuff. And so she managed to stay calm somehow, which was a big thing for her, because she was a very temperamental woman and uh, she just asked him well you know you seem to know her well how do you know I heard she writes her own stuff she just says it and, and he said well no 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 somebody teaches it to her first so she can pretend to dictate it and that is her own stuff uh, and then but no she doesn't she's just too dumb and as they left a carriage she told him well idiot I am this Olympe de Gouges whom you speak of and you know I would never be your friend so stop saying that um, 
and and that that kind of story is what was told uh-huh. again and again. The yeah. gossip was spread. She she got in trouble with some some actors at the uh, French mm-hmm. theatre, and then they told everyone that she couldn't mm-hmm. read as well. Mm-hmm. But um, explain us a bit to understand mm-hmm. what kind of importance it had at that time, writing uh, p- uh, play plays for theatre and the political okay. meaning of uh, being such a playwright so, and being discussed in public. Yes. So we're, we're talking about the years before the revolution and, and that's when Beaumarchais, for instance, was writing and his plays were very political uh, and she really admired yeah. Beaumarchais. Uh, she went to knock and What his door. kind of plays so, did she write? So she also wrote political plays. Um, she wrote a play, her most famous play is a play about or against slavery. It's called Miska. Zamur and Mirza mm. and it's a story of uh, slaves who are running away and they're shipwrecked on an island and they make friends with some other people and eventually they're caught again but they're forgiven. Yeah. And, and it's all about showing that, uh, that, that slavery is wrong and, and that there is no inequality between people of, of different In skin fact, colors. There was a, there was a movement within the French Revolution for abolitionism. Yeah. Um, and and that, that was um, the, the most famous part of that movement was started by uh, Mirabeau and Condorcet yeah. and Brissot and it was the Société des Amis des Noirs, the Society of the Friends of the Black. Yeah. And uh, uh-huh. Olam de Gouges was writing about slavery before that and she was, it was Brissot in fact who made sure that her play was performed because the academy was a bit, you know, they didn't want yeah. to perform it because yeah. they didn't like her. Yeah. And he invited her to be one of the early members of the society. So she, she was actually quite influential in that sense. But she also wrote plays about divorce, uh, about women mm-hmm. being forced to take vows to go into convents. Now we are going to the next uh, mm. topic. Mm. So we talked about her being a playwright and what it meant mm. at that time in Paris. But yes, her philosophical yes. importance or why we think she is uh, worth of being studied <laughs> in the philosophical sense uh, depends on her having written the Declaration yes. of the Rights of Women. So explain, please explain this uh, now to us, mm. also in comparison to the Declaration de l'Homme. Okay. So that's, I mean, that's, that's obviously her most famous text, and perhaps not the most interesting one philosophically, actually. But it's, um, so she wrote it almost as a parody. It takes, it follows the Déclaration des droits de l'homme, um, which was published just here. Yes, it follows it step by step, Is but it? every time she says, it says man, she says woman. It's, I think, well, it's also meant to be taken seriously in some sense, but I think that the philosophy comes before and after in the letter to the Queen, and then... Okay, but uh, I found it always very interesting that she added very specialized things on the right of adoption, a child, yes. and, you know, and the right before mm-hmm. court, and so on. So she specialized mm-hmm. it very well. So that, that's something that actually uh, Sophie Gauchy also talks about, and I think, um, to be fair, it's Montesquieu who started the whole thing, talking about... The, the specific laws to do with parenthood, with adoption, the laws to do with um, what happens when you have a child out of wedlock, whether that child should be recognized, given the same rights as a child who's born within marriage. And that's something that, that concerns a lot of women at the time, because if you're a man and you have an illegitimate child, well, you can just you know, go about your own business in the 18th century. If you're a woman that happens to you, then you're left to bring up the child and you have no rights either for yourself or for the child. And that means very often poverty for both the mother and the child. And that's something that she was extremely concerned with. She was a very practical philosopher. And, and a lot of her texts are concerned with making the, the French public and, and the French politicians especially recognize the, the poverty that women are mm. drawn into mm-hmm. because of um, the kind of stupid decisions mm-hmm. that are made mm-hmm. at, at the level mm-hmm. of documents mm-hmm. like okay. the rights mm-hmm. of man. Okay, so um, you said mm-hmm. that you hold that the preamble and the end of this is a more philosophical I issue. Think, I Explain think so. Explain that there are other texts that are more philosophical. I think Which so. One? So um, so just the thing about the, the preamble and the, the Istanbul, I guess. Yeah. Um, 
in, in that she, she has this uh, this interesting um, this interesting phrase she says that uh, so she says that women have women are basically vicious they're not virtuous and um, that when they're not allowed to participate in politics as citizens what they do is that they use uh, they, 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 they work through nocturnal ministrations. Okay, that, that's a fantastic <laughs> phrase. Um, and, and people read that and they think, well, she's being a bit sexist here, very much in the same way that they think that about Wollstonecraft. And, and there is an interesting parallel here, which is namely that she thinks women only do harm, and she says women do harm and have done a lot of harm in politics when they're not allowed to participate. And Wollstonecraft says something very similar when she says that um, she's in her letter to Talleyrand in the preface of the Vindication of the Rights of Women, she says, well, if, if women are not uh, treated as rational beings, if they're not allowed to do politics as a man would, they're going to do it anyway, because no, no matter how much you fail to educate women, no matter how much you, you put us down, uh, we, we are still rational beings we're not we're not animals and so we're going to okay, try this is wonderful okay. but before we switch yeah. to mary wollstonecraft yes please let us okay. now yeah, yeah. Uh, and bring think, perhaps yes. olaf de gouche mm. to death yeah how did she come how did right so come? as well as writing um plays then she wrote she wrote um and, and as well as writing more longer philosophical um pamphlets or, or even books the one i'm talking about on what, thursday uh, Le Bonheur Primitif is, uh, is a small treatise, so she's not just a playwright, she's not just a pamphlet writer, she's also a proper philosopher in, in the sense that, you know, we understand philosophers when we talk about male philosophers, I suppose. Mm -hmm. um, she, she wrote long things that were sustained arguments, etc. Uh, but she, she also wrote uh, placards, she wrote things, articles that were printed on one page and posted all over the walls of Paris. And she wasn't the only one to do that. Um, you know, everyone did that in the revolution. That's how you shared ideas. So even Condorcet, etc., they, they all did that. If you wanted something publicized, you printed it on one page and you posted it everywhere in Paris. And she was she was having it printed herself. She had her printer and she also had her, um, I don't know, her distributor, I guess. And towards the end of her life, she was she'd been getting into more and more trouble because she was um, writing letters against Robespierre, for instance. She was being very... Why did um, she write against Robespierre? Well, so it was the famous you? Trois... Yeah, Les Trois okay, Les Trois Zion. That's yeah. the last text. That's yeah. the text that, that, yeah. that, that did for her. Yeah. But before that, she was accusing Robespierre of corruption. Uh, she was denouncing his treatment of the Girondins. She, uh, she, she, saw, she saw the end coming of the terror and, and she was instead of uh, going into hiding, she was very vocal against um, the ruling party. And, and then eventually she decided to go into hiding. She went with her son and, and her son's wife to their country house, a house that she just bought. Uh, but then she decided to come back to Paris for one, one more poster, and that was Les Trois Urnes, uh, in which she, she advocated, she, she asked um, that uh, there should be a referendum, in fact, asking the French people what sort of government, what sort of a republic they wanted. Okay, whether they wanted uh, Which a direct democracy. Did she offer? Exactly. So there was direct democracy, there was a federated state like the United States, and, and there was also constitutional monarchy. So let the people choose. And the very fact that she'd proposed constitutional monarchy and that she'd questioned the government and the republic as it was meant that Do she was arrested uh, immediately. Wonderful. Mm. Do you think that she was in that political action singular or did she have a club of friends who supported the Troisur? One can she understand was... that there are friends and these things never emerge mm. from one only, but... Uh, she was she was uh, she was a Girondin, but so she I mean she was very yeah. close to Girondin. But by the time she published this, she was very much by herself because they'd already been arrested, as, as yeah. far as I know, uh, yeah. and they weren't. Or if those who weren't arrested were in hiding. Yeah. Yeah. So I think she was. I think she was always thinking her own thoughts, mm. and because she was very mm. quick about having them published, yep. there wasn't much time for consultation yep. most of the time. Mm -hmm. So I think in, in that case, especially mm -hmm. because most of her allies were either mm -hmm. in prison or in hiding, mm -hmm. it was mm -hmm. just the wrong thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
So thank you so far. Now we will have a small discussion on Mary Wollstonecraft. Mary Wollstonecraft, indeed one of the great and very, very famous women philosophers. Hugely discussed for various reasons, we will shortly do that. But again, we are very happy to hear from an expert like you, to, who has written one or more books, sorry for not knowing that, I think two books on Mary Wollstonecraft. Uh, just the one on, specifically on her, and I've edited one with Alan Coffey as yes. well. Yes, mm -hmm. only recently mm -hmm. this book has mm -hmm. turned out and is dedicated again to a new perspective on mm -hmm. Mary Wollstonecraft. So we are especially grateful in the more as Mary Wollstonecraft seems to be able to fit into many different interpretations mm -hmm. of feminist philosophy and uh, the history of philosophy and so on. So let's start again to give us an idea of her life, which was an exciting life. Okay, so let's start again with her death because it's also <laughs> more spectacular um, than her birth. She, um, she died very young. She died um, before her 40th birthday. Um, just 10 days after giving birth to her daughter, who's, who became Mary Shelley. And she had puerperal fever, it was all very messy, very painful, thank you very much. Um, and she left a baby, Mary Shelley, uh, an older daughter who was uh, three or four maybe at the time, uh, Fanny, and a husband, her brand new husband, William Godwin. And, um, oh, thank you. So she, she wasn't, just like Olam de Gou, she wasn't born from a rich family and she didn't get much of an education. She had a very unpleasant father who was um, a gambler and an alcoholic and, 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 and violent as well. Um, Godwin in his biography tells us that when she was a, a little girl, she sometimes she used to go and have to sleep in front of her mother's bedroom door if her father had been at the bottle and, and uh, he thought that she thought that he might become violent, so she would sleep in front of the door, bring her mattress there so that he didn't get in. Um, she picked up her education wherever they were. They moved around a lot because he had to move away from his debts. And um, then she, she met a couple of friends, one when she was a very young teenager. She was living in Yorkshire, whose father was a philosopher and had a great library, and so she she endeared herself to family and basically hung out in their library and read everything she could. And then later on when she moved to London, she also met a, a nice couple who had loads of books, including books by Rousseau. Uh, and she became a big fan of Rousseau then. And that's significant because Rousseau is always in the background of her thinking. Sometimes as, as a friend, she models a lot of her writing style on him and but more often as an enemy because, let's face it, his writings about women are mostly very unpleasant, um, but so she she responds to so a lot. Is always in the background. Um, she worked a lot. She did a lot of different jobs before she became a writer. She worked as a lady's companion, so she could go away from home. She worked. Uh, she set up her own school in North London twice, in fact. She worked as a private tutor in Ireland with a, a rich aristocratic family and she hated it and, and, and a lot of the things that she says about aristocratic women come from uh, her experience of that one boss that she didn't like. But she uh, must have had a good reputation when she was enabled to take over jobs like these. Well, I don't know if it's a matter of... It's, I think it's good references. Right? Yeah. I think she was lucky that she... Well, she, she had the kind of personality that allowed her to, um, to be confident in making friends and, and showing the best sides of herself. Mm. She was very intelligent and she could show it. And she wasn't afraid to show it. She didn't have any of that shyness that uh, women yeah. were supposed to have. Mm. Yeah. She wasn't a delicate, sensitive soul. Um, so she, she made a lot of friends, actually, a lot of influential friends when she lived in North London because she lived in a, a place that was a, a settlement for the, um, the rational dissenters. So the, the dissenters also, they were, they were, dissenters were kind of a religious sect 
I suppose, and they dissented from the Church of England. Uh, they had a, f a few different beliefs. I mean, nothing that dramatic, mm. actually. Yeah. Uh, but the, sometimes they question the Trinity, mm. for mm. instance. Mm. But mainly because they, before, because they dissented mm -hmm. from the Church of England, mm. that meant they weren't allowed mm. to attend Oxford or Cambridge. Mm -hmm. And so they had to have their own universities. Uh, so, so they gathered together in, in little villages, for instance, around, for instance, in North London, near Islington, and, um, and they set up teaching centers there, sort of private schools for people from their community. And was she taught or was she No, learned? no, she, no she, just, she just hung out with them, basically. She okay. had her own school, but it wasn't, yeah. she was okay. never a dissenter. Yeah, yeah. Herself. Okay. But this um, is interesting. But it, but was it, a community it, it explains yeah. a lot mm. that she was very much involved in a yes. certain kind of society and so on. Because one has to admit that she was very successful also during her life. She was. When we think about the many books mm. she wrote, whom she wrote, yes. whom she reviewed, and she was mm. up to the height of so many. Give she us was. some uh, ideas. So yeah, she, she was extremely. So, so, so um, so she, in fact, she got successful through um, Richard Price, a reverend, to who was her neighbour, because he became a very good friend, and he gave a talk celebrating the French Revolution and the, the English Revolution a hundred years before, yeah. and that talk was replied to by Edmund Burke with yeah, his yeah. pamphlet um, yeah. on the revolution in France, where he criticises the revolution, he criticises uh, republicanism, and he criticises Price as well, Richard Price, very personally. So a whole bunch of people responded to this, to, to Burke's revolution. And the first published response was Mary Wollstonecraft, and it was uh, Vindication as the Rights of Men. Yeah. The second one was Thomas Paine's On the Rights of Man. And then there was another one as well a bit later by uh, Catherine Macaulay, the historian and, and Republican philosopher, who was um, a great model for, for Wollstonecraft. Did she so, meet her personally? No, she didn't. Um, I think what was it make mm, the our audience clear for one small moment who is uh, Macaulay and why was she so important at that time? She was important because she was a very famous historian. Uh, she'd written a history of England. She'd also written some letters on education. She was a Republican thinker who had a huge influence in revolutionary France and also during the American Revolution. Yeah. Yeah. So and this was right. what mm -hmm. Mary Wollstonecraft had already exactly. as a model. Yes. 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 Okay. As now you already started to speak about her vindication of the rights of men, mm -hmm. and then that she wrote two years uh, later only the vindication of the rights of women. And let us just point for okay. a few minutes and phrases to these two books and to, and to understand why she did write the second book after the first, if it is parallel and what it is about. Okay, so it's definitely parallel. And I, I don't know exactly how it came about that she wrote not that book. But not a book. parody. <laughs> no, it's not a parody, absolutely not. There was a parody of her book written, actually, on oh. the vindica of vindication as a rights of... Um, I think apes or children, mm. apes and children, by Taylor, I think, or more, no more, more. Okay, oh, I can't quite remember. But there was a parody oh, written of it. This is, uh -huh. um, but but her work tended to be well received, and and she got the she got the nickname uh, Hyena in Petticoat. That wasn't because of the rights of women. It was because of the first book because she was a Republican. But otherwise, people kind of liked her. The rights of women. Um, she probably wrote, I, I fancy that, you know, her editor Johnson said to her one day, look, you're always going on about women. Well, why don't you write a book about it instead of boring us with your constant complaints at dinner? Um, and she wrote it in, in just a few weeks. And, and she said that uh, she was dissatisfied with it because she said the devil was always at the door. And the devil, of course, is a printer saying, yeah, you know, I'm waiting for my next folio here. You've only got like uh, 15 pages. I need the 16th. Please bring it now. Uh, what so tells us also down. about her fame she <laughs> had, yes. because the printer knew, the editor knew yes, that she will quick. earn some. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, earn some, yeah. Um, so the part of the reason why 
she got so famous with that book and part of the reason why it was so well received is because a lot of it was about education and that was a hugely popular topic at the time. There were plenty of books written yeah. about reforming women's education. So all the stuff about rights and republicanism kind of got but not covered so much Speaking about the, the books press. on mm. uh, education of women. Only to refer to Germany because mm. there is, you know, a certain line the people say, they say, so the first revolution of yeah. women took place in France, then it went to England, mm, right. and then it came to Germany. So I'm always mm. laughing about that because I think one has to mm. have another look at that. In Germany, from the end of the 1600s, mm. 1690, 97, mm. so the first educational books appear and are published yeah. and the huge time in Germany of girls education is 1706, mm. 1712 and so on this mm. early time. So from that perspective Mary Wollstonecraft is very late with yes. her education book. Yeah, yeah. no absolutely and uh, and it, it was fashionable then in England as well, and yeah. it was just beginning to pick up. People were beginning to take it quite seriously yeah. then, but it's true that before it hadn't been. I mean, since uh, the Renaissance, the education of women hadn't been a thing in England. So, yeah, there was this huge gap um, where, you know, oh. Elizabeth was super educated, Elizabeth I, and then, then you know, until the late 18th century, women were getting a really bad deal, and, and then they started talking about reforming it. Okay, right. okay. So I think say, this is a very exciting discussion, um, but um, I think what is interesting for our audience is to understand yes. and to get an answer to the problem. Because Mary Wollstonecraft is intensively referring, and this is what mm. I like with her, that she says, it is reason. So to a certain extent, mm. One says she's in the sense of the 18th century, and if you read her mm -hmm. with the good knowledge of Kant, you see that there are many similar formulations on reasonability, what reason mm -hmm. means. So she has an idea of reason like the Kantsche Vernunft to a certain extent and so on. And, uh, and this is exactly what made her dangerous, yes. uh, ambiguous, for 20th century mm -hmm. interpretation, and uh, so tell us about that. Okay, so yes, I mean, there's um, th there's a sense when, when you read Wollstonecraft, especially the, the first three chapters, where you think, oh, she's really down on the emotions, and she wants everyone to be super rational and not to feel anything, um, that she's not much better than Kant, really. Now, that, that's wrong, Why I think. do the feminists not like uh, rationality, reason, and Well, so I on? blame it on uh, <laughs> Genevieve Lloyd. Uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> but I think... Okay. I think with, with Wollstonecraft, it's not much, so much... The objection isn't so much that, that she, she's... Um, she places so much weight on reason, but that she places so little on the emotion. But even that's not true. I think one gets a very bad impression of what she's doing by just looking at the first three chapters. And then maybe maybe people just look at the first three chapters and then they get bored and, and they don't know uh, what she does with the emotions later on. But she's very... I she's, think mm, you point mm, this out mm, very mm. well in the book you have edited mm. now with coffee. And I think it is a very up-to-date interpretation mm. of it. And it's a highly differentiated view on mm. her. And I think it is, although I don't know, and we will see how up-to-date feminism will respond to mm. that, because I think with this book, you succeed to make understand, mm. you take a new step, you know, also in feminism mm. and so on, by showing that we don't have to continue and to oppose and mm. to make up the di dichotomies yeah. between reason and emotion yeah. and so on. And you show this with Wollstonecraft, mm. how she is bringing all these topics together. Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, so, I think she really is. I think, I think the image of her as, as somebody who's enamored with reason it is wrong. I think she's very concerned is about Is that wrong or is it that our former understanding of a, let's say, of a, a um, isolated idea of reasonability and an isolated idea of emotion I think, I think that's right. was wrong. I think that's and that right. we yeah. finally yes. start to understand yes. that yeah. it is nonsense yes. to say this yes. is here and this is there. You know, but we mm -hmm. have 
now worked about other categories mm. that show us that we can't yeah. oppose mm. these things. And yes, I think, yeah. I think that's that. I think she's yeah. yeah and, uh, absolutely uh, but right. what is in the book I, I mentioned and the book you have edited now mm -hmm. on Rustengraf? So uh, mostly uh, Susan James is pointing to her relation. So I found it wonderfully. So uh, really, I found it wonderfully, found it wonderfully because it is shown that this trying to bring the concepts together first relates to her reception of ancient philosophy mm -hmm. and secondly uh, results in her reference to natural rights. Yeah. Can you explain that? So, okay, so that, that's, you're talking about Sue James' article yeah. on, okay. Yeah. So, um, and the, also the first ones, yes, I think this yes. is really new now and this is the mm. first attempt that I have mm. realized now that going to the history of women philosophers and to position them yeah. in the history of yeah. philosophy, which is really mm. now to refer, what did they know on antiquity? Mm -hmm. What kind of concepts are vivid here? That's, uh, so if, if you like that book, for that reason, you're going to like the next one. Uh, <laughs> Good. <laughs> which is this, this, um, so yeah. Routledge got this wonderful new series. It's, you take one philosopher and you get 40 chapters on all the influence, the themes, yeah. etc. And we're doing, again with Alan, but also with uh, Alin Hambotting from Notre yeah. Dame, we're doing the Wollstonecraftian mind. Okay. Uh, and that's going to have a number of chapters on, on the influence, for instance, of antiquity, or um, or the um, kind of the early modern writers yeah. and, and Locke and Hobbes, yeah. etc. Yeah. Uh, and so we're going to find out a lot more. I'm I'm hoping about what what she read, what she took into account. And that's something that's always a bit more difficult with women philosophers because they tend, unless they're you know, very rich, they tend not to leave a library behind. They don't have a collection of books with all their notes. So with Wollstonecraft, she didn't even have a house. So we don't we we're not in any position to know what she'd read, except insofar as she did write reviews for Johnson. So if she wrote a review of it, then presumably she'd read it, one hopes. Um, but otherwise we don't know. And when it comes to the antiquity in particular, it's quite difficult because she didn't really know Greek or Latin, and, and there was who very, does today. Oh, we do philosophy. But now, now, now we have now we have the translations. <laughs> Whereas, <laughs> yeah, <but> unfortunately, the, <laughs> the, so the wrongest of wrongest. <laughs> now of there is Google. The complete, the complete works of Plato were translated the year after her death. Um, but the, the, you know, the intellectual mm. world was full of Platonism. Of course, full of the fire of, of Platonism. Of course, so, so there were, and, and there were some things that were translated. Uh, what they're most interested in is whether she'd read Aristotle, because I, so I read her as a virtue yeah. ethicist. I find a lot of yeah. Aristotle in in her thoughts. But tell us about that. Um, tell us so, about that. I mean, that that yes. goes back to what and then we end because we have to come to an end. I'm <laughs> yeah. very sorry about that. Uh, but this is a very yeah. interesting and important topic I, I which think, you uh, brought mm, up now to read her as a virtual virtual ethicist yeah. in the tradition so and in the difference to so it's, it's very clear when you look for instance at her discussion of the virtues of modesty and chastity that that she's got the idea that a virtue is a mean between two extremes mm -hmm. um, and that it has to be regulated by reason uh, and that the emotions are strengthened and, and made um, more usable more kind of life friendly I suppose mm. by mm. a good education and by the use of reason yeah. uh, and that, so that's all very Aristotelian and that's what you were saying as well earlier about how reason and emotions are part of the same thing it's embodied reason it's not just two, two distinct worlds existing alongside each other so I think that that's quite interesting for that reason but had she read Aristotle well there's uh, one sentence in the rights of men when she's criticizing Burke and she says he hasn't is misinterpreted a bit of the politics here. And it's a footnote. And that's all we know. So there was one edition of uh, the politics that was translated in uh, 1598 by the poet John Donne. Presumably, mm -hmm. we don't know for sure. Mm -hmm. Maybe she read that. Maybe she just had her friends, uh, the dissenters, telling her about Aristotle's politics. Um, but it's quite likely that she knew that text, I think. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, I think. So, thank you very much, Sandrine, for thank this you. expertise.
on these women philosophers and we are looking forward to meet you with other experts in our series conversations with Diotima. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.